For chapter 11, we're going to examine the relationship between markets and government. And one way to think about what we're going to do is to now try to apply the economic way of thinking and all the sort of strategies and theories and tools that we've used so far to analyze how government behaves. And so we're going to start with a story. Right? The story is something like the following. There was a king who decided that he needed a new court singer, an official singer for the, for the court, um, and decided to send his out to the countryside to find the, the best singer out there and to make that person the, the new court singer. You can think, you know, American Idol or something like that. So the king's minions go out and they come back with two finalists. And they bring them into the throne room to sing for the king. And the first one sings. And when the first one's the first one done, the king says, nope, that's it. He says, I'm awarding the job to the second singer because that first singer was just terrible. Right? And the job is awarded to the second singer. Now, if we think about this for a minute, what's the potential problem here, right? It's possible, at least, that the second singer is even worse, right? Just because the first singer is bad doesn't mean the second singer is automatically better. And this little story about the King Singer is a good analogy for the way in which economists have, been think, have thought historically, uh, had thought historically anyway, about the relationship between what markets do and what government do. Does. And let me see if I can explain that uh, the following way. For much of the 20th century, economists focused on what they called market failure. And that was the argument and the ways in which, sort of documenting, the ways in which markets uh, would not turn out sort of perfect results, right? Markets would fail because they wouldn't create the sort of optimal equilibrium outcome. If you want a good example of this, think about our discussion of externalities from the previous chapter, from chapter 10. Externalities are perfect examples of this notion of market failure, right? We could have these external social costs, right? The polluter uh, imposes on other people, for example, uh, and that's a failure, right? Because the, the polluters aren't taking into account the full costs on, on all parties of their action. So markets aren't doing what they're supposed to do, which is take account of those costs and make sure that people behave uh, 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 appropriately. So historically, right, the solution to market failures was to say, all right, well, let's get government involved. And, and, you know, we didn't really talk about this too much. We talked a little bit, right? But there's all kinds of sort of fancy models that show if you get government involved in this and sort of take the simple one we did talk about, suppose what we decide to do in the case of polluters, right, is to say, well, all right, let's just tax the polluters by the amount of the cost they're imposing on other people. We'll tax them. We'll bring in the revenue equal to the amount of that cost, and we'll redistribute that money back out to the victims of the pollution and compensate them for the pollution. On paper, right, this sounds good. This is government stepping in to sort of fix this market failure. And so for a long time, again, throughout the 20th century, these are the kind of models that economists built. They simply said, all right, the market fails, therefore government ought to step in, and here's this blackboard model of how they might do it, right? Uh, and that'll solve the problem. But what's the problem with that, right? Well, it's the King Singer problem, right? The problem here is, can we actually assume that government will do what we say it will do on, on the blackboard? That is, we can draw up those models, but is that how government's actually going to behave? Put differently, is it possible that the solutions that we, we, we suggest for market failure end up being examples of government failure? That is, why assume that government will do exactly what we say it will do on the blackboard? We've got examples of markets not doing that. Why, why might not government fail as well? And so to understand that question, to answer that question, Right? We need to examine politics more closely. We need to examine the way people behave politically. And here's where the economic way of thinking comes in. Right? We want to ask the same kinds of questions about politics that we have about markets. That is, what is the information people have? What are the incentives people have? And how do individuals choose based on those incentives and information? Put differently, we can't just assume that people in the marketplace are sort of self-interested and motivated by profit or utility or whatever we want to talk about. And then magically, when they become part of the political process, they suddenly care about everything else. They suddenly care about the public interest. They suddenly care uh, about things other than, than broadly speaking, their self-interest. Right? And so asking those kind of questions right, lets us examine uh, all of these things uh, in, in, in more detail. So two little detours first. This idea, this, this notion right, that we should look at uh, the, the political process through the eyes of the economic way of thinking and, and bring the same assumptions there as we, as we do to, to the political process as we do to the market process, uh, was pioneered really in the 1950s and 1960s by a number of economists. Foremost among them was James Buchanan, who won the Nobel Prize for this work in 1986, but also people like Gordon Tullock, uh, uh, Bill Niskanen, uh, 
Anthony Downs, and several other economists uh, as well, who founded what's now known as the Public Choice School of Economics. And even that name, right, suggests what's happening here, which is we think about economics usually as about private choices, the choices that people make, households make, that firms make, sort of private entities make. But we can use economics and the economic way of thinking to analyze public choices as well. That is, how do people choose within the realm of politics? And so as a broader example here, right, we might sort of think about, you know, why is it that we think we need government in the first place, right? What, what problems are gov is government solving? And one broad category of problems that government appears to solve, right, are free rider problems. So, for example, imagine we want to uh, build a dam. To, to, you know, we, we have a sort of river that flows through the mountains and we've got people living in the valley. We want to build a dam to stop this river from continually flooding the, the town in the valley. So... Suppose we try to build to build this dam sort of through the private sector, right? We go around house to house and we say to people, um, "Would you like to contribute to building this to building this dam that we're going to create?" Right? And what's the problem here, right? The everyone thinks to themselves, "Well, I'd love to contribute, but if everyone else contributes enough and the dam gets built, right, I'm going to be protected by that dam even if I don't pay for it, right?" The 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 dam is a public good; it has positive externalities to it. Not everyone who pays for it will benefit. Every, people who don't pay for it will nonetheless still benefit from it. And this is what we call free riding, right? The ability to gain those benefits without paying for it. Well, you can see what the problem here is. If everyone starts to think this way, no one's willing to pay up, pony up money for the, for the dam. The dam doesn't get built and everybody's worse off. So the question is, how do we ensure that this dam gets built? And one answer is, this is, this is a potential role for government to step in and say, no, we're going to solve this uh, free rider problem through coercion. We're going to force everyone through to the taxes to pay for the dam, and then we'll build a dam and things will be fine. Okay, now, again, in theory, that sounds great. But the question, as we've already suggested, is what actually happens in practice? Is that the way it really works? And we've already suggested one of, of, of a couple of things we might think about here to sort of break open that black box of the political process and, and understand uh, how, how, people, how people might actually behave. So the first thing that I want to talk about here, the first sort of uh, assumption or, or challenge we want to make to that, to that view of government is the idea of behavioral symmetry, right? And we've already said what this is, I just didn't use that term, which is the following. We need to assume that people are motivated in the same sorts of ways, whether they're acting in the marketplace or whether they're acting in politics. So whatever assumption we make about one, we need to make about the other. And if we assume in markets that people are broadly self-interested, they care about themselves and their friends and their family, and that's who they will sort of you know, attempt to, to, to satisfy first, we have to make the same assumption when they move into politics, right? We have to analyze both processes with the same view of human beings. Again, it's not like when you become a politician or a bureaucrat, you magically change into this whole different creature, right? You, you simply don't, right? People are people, and they are motivated by the same sorts of things in both realms. And what this lets us think about, and this is the second point, is to understand that politics is another way of engaging in exchange. One of the key things that the public choice theorists, Buchanan, Tulloch, and the rest uh, emphasized was that people try to improve themselves through exchange. That's just what we do. That's who we are as human beings. Economists have talked about this you know, from Adam Smith, if not before. And so if we understand people as trying to improve themselves and increase their want satisfaction and those of their again, friends and family through exchange, that's going to be true in politics, too. Why do people enter into politics? Why do people engage in political transactions? Right To improve themselves somehow. They think they'll be better off by doing it. Those can be understood as processes of, of exchange. Uh, for example, right when we vote, we're sending, we're trying to put people in office, and we're hoping that they will deliver certain policies for us. Right when politicians vote for certain kinds of things, what they're saying is we want to please our constituents, so they'll vote for us and they'll, they'll put us into office. Or we want to please, or we want to get get hands in the power of certain bureaucrats because we think that they will they will support us as well. So all of these parties are the bureaucrats, the, the politicians, the voters are exchanging with one another, right? Attempting to improve themselves by by trading uh, trading votes and power and money, right? For all different kinds of things. So one of the ways that we can we can think about what it is that politicians do or politicians are. The way we've talked about firms as being profit seekers and we talk about you know, individuals as seeking utility, politicians are vote seekers, right? That's what, that's what they want. That's what, uh, that's what drives their, their behavior. And we can see this manifested in, in all kinds of ways. When we understand that, right, we can understand a third really important part of this process, and that's what economists call rent seeking. 
Okay, the word rent here doesn't mean rent like what you pay in a house. It means uh, the, the, the return to a particular privilege, right? So what, when, when people lobby, when, when uh, corporations lobby to get, uh, to get subsidies or to penalize their competition or to get a specialized tax break, what they're doing is seeking after these rents. And rents here simply mean, uh, uh, you can think of it like profits, but it's not profits from sort of selling a good. It's the benefit they get from having a government-granted privilege. The taxi cabs who have monopolies and, and are able to use that to shut out Uber Right or make Uber's life difficult. Those taxi cabs are rent seekers. They have a rent to that to that monopoly, a gain to that monopoly. And so all of this activity that we see in Washington with lobbying and so forth, all of that rent seeking activity uh, is is uh, is one of the th is is part of this process of politics as exchange. And one of the things that Buchanan and Tulloch in particular identified was that this rent seeking is an additional wasteful part of what it is uh, of, of what the political process generates. Right? If you think about, uh, we we know already from our earlier conversations how that monopolies are, are, are wasteful, right? That monopolies cause fewer exchanges to take place, prices to be higher than they would otherwise, get lower output, fewer exchanges, right? That's part of the waste of monopoly, that, that dead weight loss. But the other part is all the expenditures people engage in to attempt to obtain that monopoly. Right, all the lobbying, all the going to Congress, all of that kind of stuff. If government wasn't handing those things out in the first place, there wouldn't be all those expenditures. Those resources could be used for directly satisfying people's wants. So what all these things add up to is saying we can't just assume that government will do what we say on the blackboard it will do. And so the one quick example we'll explore more in the later chapters when we talk about macroeconomics. But think about budget deficits, right? The idea that government every year spends way more than it takes in, in, in taxes. Why is that? Well, there's no economist who thinks this is a good idea to do this year after year after year. And when, we, when some economists first argued that governments ought to run deficits, uh, the argument was they should run deficits during recessions, during times of, of economic difficulty. And then when the economy was good, you would run surpluses that would pay for the deficit. So over time, you would, you would balance the budget, right? You would, you, you know, revenues and expenditures would equal. Yet it hasn't worked out that way, right? For some strange reason, every single year, pretty much with a few, but just a very few exceptions, every single year really since about World War II, if not before, we've run a deficit. Why? Well, think of it this way. From the, from the perspective of politicians, deficits work to their self-interest. Surpluses don't. Politicians want to be able to go to their constituents and say, look at all the money we spent on these various programs that benefit you. And guess what? We didn't raise your taxes. Well, you spend a lot of money, you don't raise taxes, you get deficits. And if you try to cure the deficits and say, well, we got to cut spending or raise taxes, politicians go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want to do that because people aren't going to vote for me if I raise their taxes or I cut off the benefits that, you're, that they're getting. So even though it sounds great in theory, we run deficits in the bad times, surpluses in the good, it'll all even out. In practice, the real information and the real incentives facing government actors, facing politicians, are such that it's simply not in their interest. The, inst the, the incentives created by the institutions of politics do not uh, favor running balanced budgets even over time. What they favor is continued growing deficits, and more or less, uh, that, that, that's what we've seen. One last small point to consider, too. What do we even mean by the public interest? How do, how do government officials, how do pol politicians know what the public interest is? How do they even know what women's interest is? We say this legislation is in the interest of women. Well, t take one. Should we, for example, force employers to provide insurance for part-time workers, health insurance for part-time workers who are, tend to be predominantly female? Sounds like, yeah, that's a great idea, right? We'll, we'll, we'll make them do that. Uh, that'll help women out, and that's pro-women. That's you know, women's, uh, the public interest of women. But wait a second. Two-thirds of new small businesses are started by women every year. This would put an enormous burden on them to have to provide that for their employees. Suddenly, women entrepreneurs are being harmed by this legislation. Is this in the public interest of women? Right? What, what do we mean by the public interest? And more importantly, how do politicians know what that is? And if they can't know what it is, doesn't it seem as though, in the absence of agreement on that, they're much more likely to fall back on, that, on their self-interest, especially given the, the incentives created by the institutions? So one of the sort of big lessons, one of the morals of the story here, when we begin to think about the ways in which uh, government failure is real, right? What we end up having here is saying, well, you know, sometimes markets do fail, right? Markets aren't perfect, no doubt about it. But you can't just assume because markets fail, government will solve the problem, right? You can't make what I sometimes call the ipso facto leap which is markets failed, ipso facto, government will improve, right? We'll, we'll solve the problem. No, we don't know that. 
we have to engage in comparative analysis. We have to look really closely and say, what's the nature of this market failure? Will the proposed governmental solutions actually work, given the information and incentives facing political actors? And are there other market in, market ways, market sort of institutional solutions to this problem? Have we overlooked something like playing with the rules of the game to allow markets to work better? Have we overlooked ways in which communities can come together voluntarily without using the sort of formal political process to solve this problem? There's lots of examples of those kinds of solutions that, that you might that you might look at. The point is, you can't just assume because market fail, markets fail, government will solve the problem. One last way to think about this is ought does not imply can. If we say government ought to do X, government ought to solve this problem, that problem, whatever the problem might be, saying they ought to do it is not the same thing as saying they can do it. Knowing whether government can do it means we have to take this kind of approach we've been talking about in this chapter, using the economic way of thinking to try to figure out is this solution really something that government actors uh, have knowledge of and can have the, enough information to impose? And do they have the right incentives to impose it? Those are the questions we have to ask. And it may well be, right, that an imperfect market is better than a more imperfect government. And so one of the other things to be careful about here, too, is don't expect perfection. Human beings aren't perfect. No social system is perfect. The question is, which one's better? And in particular, one of the things to think about here that we've talked about all semester, it's not so much which one's better in the sense of which one is more likely to get sort of close to the ideal solution, but rather which one learns from its mistakes more quickly, which one self-corrects more quickly, in which system do people have the information and the incentives to figure out exactly what's going on and, and recognize their mistakes and have some sense about, about, about which direction they should go to fix them. Those are the really interesting and important comparative question. That's what we call comparative political economy. And that, I think, is the best way to think about analyzing markets and government. We just need to get away from this paradigm that says the fact that markets are sometimes imperfect automatically means government should step in to solve the problem and that they can do it and that they will do it. And, and I think that's assuming that is the mistake. Just like in the story of the King Singer, we can't assume that the second singer will be better than the first one, no matter how awful the first one was. So with that, we'll leave Chapter 11 there. There's several other supplementary videos to watch that will clarify some of these concepts and pick up on a couple things I didn't talk about but do, but do come up in the book. So make sure that you take a look at those as well.